Thank you guys, thanks for inviting me up here. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, and it's going to be some fun. Um, I work with Outreach UK, as Samuel said. Um, just a short um, story of my life. Um, I became a Christian when I was 40, so I had 40 years without Jesus, which was absolute. I thought I was having fun, actually, at all. Um, looking back at the time it was. Um, but Jesus broke into my life when I was 40 years old, and I was miles away from him. And, and he just filled me with his spirit and a real desire to reach the lost. Um, I used to worry and be anxious about things, about life and money and all sorts of stuff. And God just, I was always popping ready pills down my throat to relieve, relieve indigestion. Within three months, all that vanished. Amen. Hallelujah. And um, it just gave me a joy in my heart that, that's never gone away. And um, I just, from the very first day, I just wanted to share this wonderful treasure I'd found with everybody else that was around me. And I'd make loads of mistakes and upset people. But, but <laughs> the way to learn eventually isn't to do it. Make mistakes and God, the Holy Spirit works with you. That's what you've got to do. Get out there and do it and share. That's, that's, that's the only thing I've got to say, really. Just, just do it. Get out there and make mistakes, and the Holy Spirit will help you. Um, but that's, I just have, have that love for people, especially people that are hurting and, and desperate, and they just need to be forgiven. They don't even realise. They don't realise what this planet's for. Why we're we here? They're just bumbling along, and their, their eyes are blinded by that horrible slime you get the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your game? Um, anyone like to give me a, an idea what, what they think evangelism is? <coughs> Come on, shout them out. Any, any ideas? Outreach. Outreach, yeah. Anything else? Sharing. Sharing, yeah. Very really good. Anything else? Any other definitions you might think of? Just giving of yourself. Yeah. Giving of yourself, yeah. 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 Um, I've got some things written down here. Um, what have I got written down? Being yourself with God for others. Serving others so they may discover and respond to the good news of Jesus. The process by which people become disciples of Jesus Christ. Passing the glory of God. It's not about us, it's about God and advancing his kingdom. It's not about winning, winning an argument, it's about loving people. We don't have to win arguments, we just have to share the good news of Jesus and leave the results to the Holy Spirit. And that's... The guy that came to play, this is what his definition was, present the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. And that's been ingrained on me ever since. Um, so, that's it. Now, now, how many of you here, hands up, how many of you get, get scared when you go out to share your faith with people? It's a little bit frightening. Yeah, yeah, quite a few. How many people feel really confident and no fear at all? One or two, yeah. And the rest of you are in the middle somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's me as well. Some days I feel quite fearful, other days I'm, I'm not. But, but we don't worry about fear, because that's yeah. just the devil. De doubts and fear come from, from him. And when we've got the Holy Spirit with us, anything can happen. Um, has anyone been, in, so in fact, they've been in quarantine? Has <laughs> anyone been so had a really nasty disease of being in quarantine? No. Well, I had um, when I was a kid, I had um, chicken pox, and I wasn't allowed to go to school for two weeks, and I was stuck because it was quite infectious. And and you know, if I'd gone out, everyone would have caught it. But that's what we want to do. We want to become contagious with our faith. So when we go out and talk to people, somehow it rubs off us and, and goes into others. And somehow the love of Jesus shines out of us into other people. And they just see. Something different about us. That's what we should be praying for, that the Holy Spirit would come and anoint us so that the love of Jesus would shine out of us supernaturally. Because it's not us, it's Jesus working through us. That's what we should desire, um, to become contagious Christians. Um, so what encouragements would you have? Um, when you go out sharing your faith, what are the encouragements, would you say? Anyone, if you share your faith with someone, what, what encourages you? Any ideas? Testimonies. Sorry? Testimonies. Yeah, if they, if they <coughs> respond, yeah. Um, if, if, if someone wants to um, talk to you and engage with spiritual issues, that's encouraging, isn't it? If, if they if they move <coughs> from being a, an atheist to an agnostic, that's encouraging, isn't it? 
they move from not believing in Jesus to believing in Jesus. That's encouraging, isn't it? Any, any step forward is encouraging. If you have just a positive conversation with someone about Jesus, it's encouraging, isn't it? If you hear of your friend leading someone to Jesus, that's encouraging. There's loads of encouragement, aren't there? But also, there's, there's lots of barriers as well. Um, anyone think of the barriers that might prevent you going out sharing your faith? Or, or, fear. Uh, fear? Yeah. yeah. What sort of fear? There's all sorts of fears. What? Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Well, that's a big one, isn't yes. it? Yes. They're going to start, especially if they're a close friend of yours, they're going to reject you and never talk to you again? Yeah. That, that's never happened to me. And I've upset lots of people. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you speak to somebody on the bus or the train and they start shouting or making yeah. noise, yeah. yeah. speak to someone on the bus or a train and they start shouting. And that happened to me in a pub one. <laughs> <laughs> it was this guy that was so anti. He just he was swearing his head off and shouting and but. God broke through. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. We still managed to talk to the girl we wanted to talk to without being interrupted. Um, <coughs> anything, any other fears we might have? Law, the law of the land. The Sorry? law. The law. Oh, yeah, the the law. Yeah. law of the land. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fear of the law, yeah. yeah. Fear of your family. Fear of your family, yeah. What they might say if you, if you respond, yeah, that's a big one as well for some people, especially if you're a Muslim. A massive fear. Um, what about fear of um, not knowing how to answer people's questions? Is that, is that fear? Yeah, that's a big one as well, isn't it? But during this Go School, we'll be teaching and helping you to to learn how to answer those difficult questions, how to um, engage with people. And it's not, we don't always have to have the answer, that's a great thing. We can just say, I'm not sure about that, I've never thought about that before, well, I'll come back to you on that one. And that gives you an opportunity to talk to them again, yeah. Uh, fear of not thinking that you don't know enough scripture. Yeah, yeah. Fear that you don't know enough scripture. Yeah, none of us know the whole Bible, do we? <laughs> none of us are. None of us are. But sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit just exactly. you know, verse um, one Peter somewhere, and you get the Bible out. I always carry a New Testament in my pocket, and um, and just pray in your head. He will lead you to the right verse. And amazingly, he does quite often. Um, well, he certainly will if he wants you to share it, that's for sure. Um, yeah, so there's all sorts of barriers, aren't there? And, yes. and during this ghost school, the idea is that we will equip people to overcome those barriers. And, and the great thing about this school is that half of it is teaching in the classroom, and half is going out. Yeah. So you're putting into practice what you're learning in the morning, and that's the best way of doing it. Yes. Putting into practice, there's, there's no good having a classroom for six weeks and then walking away and thinking, well, I'm still a bit scared of going out to share my faith. Um, you know, doing it and then coming back and sharing and encouraging each other. And, and do encourage each other as you, as, as you come week by month by month, just keep encouraging each other and sharing your stories. And try and think of ways you can talk to people with friends and colleagues and whatnot as you go along. Um, right, there's a bit of scripture here. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I'll just read it out. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us to us, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We're, you know, we're called to be Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Hi guys, good to see you. Um, yeah, so it's just amazing, isn't it, that those verses there. Um, and as we become believers and, and grow in the Lord Jesus and we grow in our faith and we see our hearts and minds take on new values, we tend to start asking more spiritual questions, questions of significance and meaning. Uh, what do you want to see, Lord, happen in my life? What is going to make a, turn, a difference eternally with what I do in my life? What does Jesus want me to do now and in the future? What would I like to look back on what I've done with my life? 
Anyone asking these questions from a reasonable sense of maturity in Christ will see that God has done two things. Firstly, he's drawn us to him. And secondly, he's asking us to go and share with others. That's the two, that's the two main things he's done. Um, and he says in, that, in those verses that we are, are ambassadors for Christ. Now, anyone got a definition for an ambassador? It's a pretty important role, isn't it? I mean, they use, the countries use their top guys to be their ambassadors. <coughs> the most gifted, the most eloquent, the most good at talking, the best people. And God's using us. Little me and little you. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? He wants to use us. Um, the definition of an ambassador is this. A diplomatic official, <coughs> Daniel, uh, Samuel, can you get us a glass of water? I've yeah, yeah. done too much shouting during the worship. Um, a diplomatic official of the highest rank sent by one country to another as his resident representative. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And God wants to use us to do that. How cool is that? Um, and a diplomat is a skillful person who deals tactfully with others. When we've got Holy Spirit with us, we can deal tactfully with even others. It's amazing what happens when you get into conversations and the Holy Spirit's with you. Um, and God's commanding us to be his ambassador, his diplomat on planet Earth. Um, and he's asking us to represent and carry on what Jesus did, begging the world to be reconciled to God. When I first read this, two things came to my mind. Um, what a responsibility. Wow, how exciting. You know, those two, the fear and the excitement were, were together. When I, when, a year after I became a Christian, in about 1993, um, you know the Berlin Wall came down and, and the country of Albania opened up, which was one of the most strongest communist countries in, in Europe, or in the world even. And it opened up and everyone there was really open spiritually and people were coming to faith everywhere, all over the place. It was very exciting. And I went over for a two-week mission. I'd only been a Christian one year. Um, I had a bit of training and they told us we should go door to door. And I was full of confidence. I was overconfident. And my confidence was in myself, not in, in God. And everyone else was going around knocking on doors and people were coming to faith and people were being healed and amazing things were happening. But nothing happened to me. Nobody was came to faith, nothing. And about after about 10 days, everyone went down to the coast for a weekend break, chilled out on the coast there by the sea, and I caught fever. And I just stayed behind in bed. And, it's, and when I was praying, God revealed to me that I was doing it in my strength and not his strength. And I spent about three hours weeping, and the fever lifted. And I just prayed, Lord, please forgive me, please give me another chance. And God is a God is a God of 100 times. Yeah, yeah. We can mess up so many times. <laughs> I've messed up 100 million times, but it still uses me. Um, and the last couple of days, me and my buddy went out. The rest of them were all in the church praising God and worshipping, and we wanted to lead people to Christ because that's what we came. We wanted to share the excitement with the others. So we went out, the two of us, but we didn't have a translator. We you know, couldn't speak the language. And we were sitting on this wall praying with our eyes shut. Lord, what are we going to do? How are we going to share our faith? We need, we need help here. We opened our eyes, and there, walking towards us, was one of the translators that was late for the church service. So she came out with us, and the next two days, two people came to faith. Praise the Lord! <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, God can do anything with everyone. We do make mistakes. So praise the um, Yeah. So if we're required to be ambassadors for Christ and help people to come to know him, why do you think it's so difficult and why do we struggle so much? I mean, we talked about some of the barriers and the fear and the doubts we have, but um, what do you think? Um, any, anyone else got any answers to that? No? What about the devil? What do you think he has to do? Any thoughts on that? If we're going out storming Satan's territory, I mean, everyone that's not Christian belongs to Satan. We're going out storming his territory, trying to grab hold of people who are in his kingdom and bring them into Jesus' kingdom. Do you think he's going to sit back and do nothing? He's not, is he? He's going to do everything in his power to pull people back. He's going to 
give us discouragement, make us have doubts and fears. He's going to bring all sorts of situations on into our lives. Some disaster happens in our family or something goes wrong just before we go decide to go, oh, I'll go next week. How many times do people have those sort of thoughts? Um, and then as you're talking to someone, you can see them being drawn towards Jesus. Then all of a sudden they turn back because the de devil's got into their brains. So while you talk to people, you have to be praying in your, in your head that the Holy Spirit will draw them towards Jesus. Yeah, you have to multitask. Even us guys have to do that. <laughs> um, so that's, that's one of the main reasons why uh, we struggle so much. So we've got to be aware of that and, and just push forward and, and break through. Um, having a great time of worship with Danny is really helpful before you go out, I can assure you. Um, so at Outreach UK and, and with the Go School, we want to try and make these training sessions as helpful and productive as we can to help turn this feeling of wanting, um, having to go out and sharing our faith, and sometimes we don't want to go out, do we? How many people really honestly don't really want to go out sometimes and share their faith? Yeah. But we've got to try and help us to turn that having to go out or feeling guilty by not going out into wanting to go out and feeling really excited and really, you know, getting out of bed thinking, yeah, today I'm going to go out and share my because that's the most exciting thing in the world. And it is the most exciting thing. There's nothing else more exciting in the whole world. Why do we, why are we deceived by the devil? Why is it that hardly anyone does it? The devil working against us. We've got to go out there and jump for joy because that's the most exciting thing. That's what we've got to do. Um, right, where are we going? Biblical reasons why we should share our faith. Um, I'd like you to, if you've got your Bibles, can you turn to Mark chapter 1? Stick your finger in there and then turn to Acts chapter 1. So look at those two bits. And we're going to have a look at how. Jesus started his ministry and how he finished his ministry. So, um, in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, um, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus had just started, finished his um, training in the desert. And he says to his disciples, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's the first thing he said in the beginning of his ministry. Come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And women, of course. Um, that's, that's, when, that's why he came, really, to train his disciples to reach the lost. He didn't say, be fishers of men. He said, I will make you fishers of men. Mm. And he wants to do that with us as well. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Yeah. Jesus longs to come alongside us and help us and transform us and equip us to be fishers of men. How exciting is that? Mm -hmm. He longs to, he desires to. But for some, some reason, most people in the churches around this country don't do it. Because they're, they're, in, they're trapped by the devil. He does all sorts of things to put them off. We've got to break through that and just get out there and do it. And then, then we share in the excitement. And it is exciting. And this course will help you go overcome all those fears and barriers. Don't worry about that as we go on. And then the last thing Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8, when uh, the disciples were in the upper room, we're in the upper room now, uh, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. Start off in your local place move out and go around the world. You know, God wants us to share the love of Jesus everywhere and, and invade the whole of this globe with telling people the good news of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will be with us. Don't worry. He's there. Sometimes we don't see him working at all. Um, I'll tell you just how they became Christians. And he went to, to India and there was these two lady missionaries and they were leading hundreds of people to faith. And he asked them, how did you become faithful? And one of them said, well, I walked along George Street in Sydney. And this old white-haired gentleman jumped out from behind a doorway and gave me this trap and said, if you were to die tonight and came before the gates of heaven, would Jesus let you in? And it 
convicted my heart so much. I went into a local church and the pastor led me to faith. And I've become a missionary and now I'm leading hundreds of thousands of people to faith. Then he went off to Africa and spoke to someone there. And he said that they were doing amazing things and leading loads of people to Christ. And he said, how did you become a Christian? I said, well, I was walking down George Street in Sydney, and this white-haired gentleman jumped out from the doorway, <laughs> handed me a tract and said, if you were to die tonight and, and came before the gates of heaven, would Jesus let you in? What would you say? And then he went over to South America, and the same thing happened there. And somewhere else, the same thing happened there. Each time it was the white-haired gentleman in George Street jumping out from the doorway, giving <laughs> me a tract and saying, if you were to die tonight, heaven forbid, and came before the gates of heaven, and Jesus said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And they were all convicted in their hearts. And, and God used them mightily all around the world. And one day he went and preached in Sydney. And he asked the pastor there, he said, do you know of an old white-haired gentleman working out of George Street? He said, oh, Tom Jenner. Yeah, he's not very well now. He, he's, he's been doing it for years. He said, well, could I go and meet him? Yeah, sure, I know where he is. I took him down. Saw this old guy. And Tom Jenner's story was in the Second World War, he was being bombed and really frightened, and someone led him to Christ. And he vowed, because God saved them actually, and he thought he was going to die. He vowed that every day he'd share his faith with 40 people. And that's what he did. He went down every day for an hour and shared with 40 ten, people. Ten people. It's ten. Ten, is it? Oh, yeah, okay. ten. The story I was going to You're probably right. Ten people. Um, so, um, and he said to George, Tom, have you ever heard of anyone coming to faith through this? He said, no, never. He shared his faith with 10 people every day for 40 years. And he never knew what had gone on at all. And when he told him what had happened all around the world, he was crying his eyes out. Two weeks later, he died. It's an amazing story. So don't be too put off that people don't respond. Mm. The first time someone shared with me, it made a massive difference. And as soon as he spoke to me, I changed the subject because I was scared of how far it would go. But it made God, the Holy Spirit was working my life. Don't, don't be put off. Um, I wasn't going to share that, but I did. <laughs> um, I, I was intending to show that video, but we will at uh, uh, some stage. Yeah. The same testimony. Is amazing. Yeah, we could see the video. Um, yeah, those are those verses. Come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. That's the first words Jesus said. And one of the last he said was, "The Holy Spirit will be with you in power." Um, right. So to go and share our faith, we need a number of things. Well, the first thing is we need credibility. Um, Romans 13, verse 8 to 13 says this. Um, just um, that up. Yeah, Romans 13. Well, start from verse 9. Um, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. But whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And verse 12 goes on to say, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. I'm oh, sorry, I suppose should be speaking. Um, I'll repeat that. Um, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let's put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. You know, we, we can't live our lives credible to Jesus. We need to put aside the, the deeds of darkness in our lives and be that sort of um, armour of light shining out. We need to um, show that love that Jesus showed, you know, love is bigger than everything, you know, if we're living a life half-heartedly for Jesus, people will spot us and, you know, how can he share his faith as he's living like that, you know, we've got to constantly try and be closer to Jesus and be more like Jesus, and then we'll have more credibility with people. Um, and the other, the other um, verses, of course, are Galatians, um, you know the fruits of the Spirit? Anyone would like to share the fruits of the Spirit? There's nine of them. Yeah. Starts off with love, joy, peace. Self-control. Yeah. Self-control. Gentleness. 
Discipline. Yeah, yeah. Gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, faithfulness. Yeah, all those. Yeah, we should desire to be more and more like that. Galatians 5. And verse 24 says this. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. You know, so much trouble happens in the churches around the UK because people are bickering in the churches and lack of unity. You know, if someone upsets you, don't get angry. Just give them grace. God gives us loads of grace, doesn't he? We should yeah. give everyone else loads of grace. Mm. If we do it, then maybe they'll catch on. <laughs> um, we'll have less arguments in the church and spend more time reaching out. Um, so we need to have credibility. We need to be diplomatic. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. You know, if we're just praying that God would help us to share the love of Jesus, you know, he will let, he will let people see like Jesus shining out of us. If we live that life that we want to, and we keep praying that prayer that, Please let Jesus shine out, his love shine out to me as I speak to people. Um, people will be drawn to you as you speak to them. I, I see it. Uh, I go out mostly door to door evangelism, and every now and then I'll meet someone and you just see them, their eyes being touched by the Holy Spirit as you're talking. And it's not me, it's just the Holy Spirit working. It's just exciting just to see that happening. Um, um, sorry, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Can you say you go around door to door? What do you yeah. mean by that? Well, I go. I work with a church, and I'll go knocking on the door and introduce myself. So I'm calling from Baptist Church up the road, and just want to talk to you about Jesus. Or do you have any? Ask them a question. Do you have any spiritual interests? And see what they say. And give, I, I normally take some newspapers with me, Christian newspapers, and give them one to read, and then pray with them or chat with them about the problems they've got. And if they're not interested, I'll go to the next step. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. You never know what's going to happen. Um, I'll tell you some stories later. Um, yeah, we've got, we need to have grace, don't we? We need to be full of grace with other people as well as how God's worked with us. And we need to be sort of seasoned with salt as well. Uh, you know, salt has all sorts of um, qualities, doesn't it? It has flavour, it has enhancement, it preserves... We need to be salty people that go out into the community. Um, just um, a remark, obvious of the time here, so we're nearly done. Um, we need to be sure of our message. We need to be able to share the gospel clearly and effectively. Now, we're not going to be teaching on that today, but that will be covered in future months. We need, we need to share, you know, we can share with our friends, can't we, how to share the gospel until we get it, until we're really happy with it. Um, and we need to learn how to answer all those difficult questions as well. Um, and this course will help you to do that as well. And you can pick up books covering all those topics and work out how to answer all the questions. And as you go out talking to people, you'll get sharpened. Iron sharpens iron. The more you do it, the better you become. You know? That's the best way, just go out and do it. And if you make mistakes, you make mistakes, who cares? Jesus is with you. Um, and you learn. People will ask you questions you never even thought of. Wow! The best thing to do when people ask you questions you never thought of is say, wow, that's a really interesting question. And it's praying your head off, saying, Lord, please give me an help me answer this one. Um, you know. And then quite often he gives you another question to ask them on top of it. I'm always asking people questions. Gets them speaking rather than me speaking. Um, I always find that's a good way. Um, so, we need to speak the language of our hearers. We don't want to speak any Christian jargon, do we, putting people off. We need to speak their language. I mean, if they're posh people, try and put on your posh voice. <laughs> <laughs> if, they're, if they're a Cockney, talk in a Cockney accent, you know. <laughs> try and be like they They're sort of leading on like this. Be like more like that. If they're sort of straight. Prim and proper type person, be like that, you know, just, you know, when Paul went out, he went, as he was in Rome, he did as the Romans did. Mm. You know, we need to, we need to watch people. We're going to do a whole session later in this course on, on um, listening skills and body language, and there's, there's an enormous amount to learning all of that. 
So, um, yes, yeah, exciting stuff and how, how people react. Um, 1 Corinthians 9. I'll just read a little bit out from verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, to win those under the law. To those not having the law, uh, I became like, like one not having the law, so to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to, to win the weak. I've become all things for all people, by all possible means, that I might save some. Mm. I mean, if Apostle Paul's like that, we should be like that. Um, I do this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. And there is enormous blessings, isn't there, sharing the gospel? Danny knows. Uh, the more you share, the more blessings you get. The more full of the spirit, the more joy you get in your heart, the more peace you get. It's just wonderful. It's what God wants us to do. That's why we're here on this planet, to go out there and share. It's the best healing medicine I know of. Mm. Um, do you know, I had the fever once, and I didn't really want to go out, so I just went out anyway. Within an hour, it's all gone. Mm. <laughs> um, and the rain goes as well, quite often. Not always, but... Um, don't let people's appearance put you off. Don't judge people before you've had a chance to speak to them. Some people, you immediately see and you think, oh, don't talk to them. They're nasty looking. Talk to them anyway. They, they're probably not very nice people. Um, you know, tra travellers, gypsies, people who just come out of prison. They all need Jesus in their lives. Can I share something? Yeah. yeah. At school, yeah. when I was at school, a guy who was at school together, and a uh, lady that spoke to me and evangelised to me, she saw him, he had just come out of prison, so she shared faith with him, and now he's a pastor. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, he got evangelised to whoever. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. For those that didn't hear, people, someone just came out of prison, someone shared with them, and now he's a path that praise God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we need to step out of our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You know you're our comfort zones. We're comfortable in this bit, but over here we're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. But the more you step out there, it gets less, it gets um, less uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so you keep doing it, it becomes comfortable in the end, That's right. and you're quite comfortable to go there, mm -hmm. and then you're uncomfortable to go there, so you do that. Oh, tie that bit a little bit. Oh, that's a bit scary. Oh, now comfortable to go there as well. You know, we can do anything with Jesus. It's wonderful. And it's exciting as well. There's, there's no better place to be than to be totally fearful and she can go out in the power of the Spirit. This is the last point. Um, our time's almost up. Our relationship must confirm our message. John 13 says this, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. I mean, if you, if you see people showing love to their Christian brothers and sisters and those people sharing around, they, you know, they'll see a difference. We don't even have to speak to them to see a difference. And then they might just come up and ask them. Ask them um, I'll just finish with the um, story of Stephen. You know, everyone knows Stephen, the mm -hmm. great evangelist that was out sharing his face and they stoned him. Yeah. Now, I'll just read with you. This is in Acts chapter 6. They chose Steve, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Wouldn't it be great to be a man full, or a woman, full of faith and the Holy Spirit and full of God's grace and power? Wouldn't it be great to be like that? Mm. That's what Stephen was like. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Then they started so stoning him. And just before he died, they looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was shining like that of an angel. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then he died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to be like that, don't we? But we'd be a real witness for Christ if you were like that, wouldn't we? Praise his name. Mm -hmm. right, that's it for this session. Uh, I think it's a tea break, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, that was great. Thank you. God use. All those sorts of people. All us lot. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm just going to read out from Isaiah 6, verse 8, if um, any of you have gone Bible. Anyone look it up?
Well, actually, I'm going to read from verse 1. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Has anyone, has anyone ever prayed that prayer? Here am I, send me. Yeah. <coughs> Hands up. Yeah. God, God really blesses those prayers. He really blesses them. You say that from your heart, he's going to use you in a mighty way. Here am I, send me. If you could say that from your heart, just go. The power of the Spirit, do God's work. He's going to bless you mightily. It's powerful words. Um, reliability is often more important than ability. If we're, if we're open and available, God's going to use us. He'll develop our ability as time goes on. You know, having loads of ability and, and no desire is, is no use to God. person God uses. 1 Corinthians 1. Brothers, think not what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. So who does God use? The foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised, those who are nothing. That's the sort of people God uses. That's us, isn't it? Amen. Um, then there's Moses. He was called at the burning bush, wasn't he? And he said to God, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Mm. He was scared stiff. And God said, I'll be with you. So who does God use? People with no confidence. Um, Moses started his ministry at the age of 80. He can use people of any age. You don't have to be young to be used by God. You can still be used by God when you're plodding around on walking sticks. Then there's um, Moses passed on the baton to um, to Joshua, and he had to take the Israelites over uh, into the Promised Land, and he was scared. God said to him, "Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you; he will never leave you or, or forsake you." You know, when we go out, the Lord our God is with us. We don't have to be fearful; He is with us. So He uses fearful people. The second ministry trip I did to Albania, um, I'd only been a Christian two years. Um, this time, Albania has loads of villages up in the mountains to go out to these mountain villages. And we had to go out for four days at a time. We were dumped there by a Land Rover for four days. There was loads of equipment to show the Jesus film. 
and we had to go around all the houses in the village and invite people to show this film in the, in the sort of market. All these villages had a little area where they met in the middle. And we put a screen up outside and, and showed this Jesus film in the evening when it was dark. And amazingly, all, the, all these villages always put us up in someone's house for, for, for a couple of days while we did this. We moved from village to village. <coughs> and um, it's pretty scary. And the guy in charge said to me, Derek, I want you to lead your team. I said, I can't lead it. These guys have been Christians for years. I'm, only, I'm just a baby in, in all this stuff. I'm, I'm not this. He said, no, I want you to lead it. He said, we've well, got some training. So we had three days training. And I was training my socks off. It's pretty scary. <laughs> and um, I always remember that the day, the day we went out, I was eating breakfast. And this guy, Don, who was organising it, came and sat down next to me and he said, how are you feeling, Derek? And I said, well, I'm pretty scared. And I was about to say to him, you sure I can't be number two rather than number one in our little team? And before I had a chance to say anything, he said to me, that's exactly where God wants you to be, and walked on. And, and, that, and it just dawned on me. You know, we can't do things in our own strength. We have to do it in God's strength. Mm -hmm. and, and God is going to be with us. And you can take away that fear. And you can use anyone. No matter how fearful we are and how equipped we are. You know, God is going to use us. And, and we saw amazing miracles and hundreds of people coming to faith in that trip. It was truly awesome. When I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? That's some great psalms, aren't they? That really encourage us. Then there was Gideon. Um, he had to go out and do some, go into battle, and um, the Lord said he would, um, the Lord turned to him and said, go in strength you have, and Save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord Gideon said, How can I save Israel? Israel, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Who does God use? The weakest. The weakest and the least. But you know, you know the story of Gideon, didn't you? He had an army of 32,000, and God reduced it down to 300. That's one percent of his armour, and he had to go out there and fight with one percent. And, and God still won. Um, and it's his strength, not ours. We don't, go, we don't go out in our strength, it's God's strength. And then, then the disciples, they were a bunch of ragabans and uneducated guys, weren't they? They were all fishermen. Fishermen were the lowest of the low in those days. Um, come follow me, said Jesus. We've already seen that verse, mm -hmm. haven't we? Um, he called them and they went after him. And Galilee, where they all came from, was a remote part of the nation where the inhabitants were less cultivated and refined and their language was very broad and uncouth. So they were really, you know, the, the lowest of the low. Their speech betrayed them, apparently. So God used them. It's amazing, isn't it? So God uses people uneducated, unrefined, uncouth, anyone. He can use all sorts. Um, then he went to and um, called Matthew, tax collector. Follow me, he told them, and Matthew got up to follow him. And um, he was um, a despised person. Yeah, the tax collectors were really despised, weren't they? Um, so in summary, God uses people who may be foolish, weak, lowly, uneducated, uncouth, despised, fearful. All we need to be is available and willing. So um, that's very encouraging, isn't it? God can use us, whatever the situation. Um, but he also wants us to be dependable people. Um, in 1 Corinthians uh, it says, I planted a seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. And success in evangelism is simply taking the initiative in the power of the Holy Spirit and presenting um, the gospel to those we're speaking to, and to help others know more about Christ and leaving the results to God. Um, 
during that mission in um, Albania, one, one time we, we had this young guy um, from the army and he was desperate to find Jesus and he didn't want to go back, he, had to, he was supposed to go back into the army and he would get a real, probably end up in prison if he didn't go, but he wanted to hear the story of Jesus and he didn't go and he stayed on to hear this, watch the Jesus film. But he, he was, he'd already seen it once, but he didn't quite grasp it. And he wanted this girl in the team to, sh to tell him and explain to him, as they went through the video, the film, what it all meant. But she was too busy doing other things and said, no, I can't do that. Anyway, we set all the equipment up in this area, about 50 people there gathered around, and the equipment didn't work. The sound, the picture was there, but the sound had gone. And the whole film is from the Gospel of Luke. So two of the girls got a Bible out, and as the film went through, one of them explained the story, and the other one explained, read the Bible verses of what Jesus, because all the words in the film were from the, straight from the Bible. So one of them read out what Jesus said, and the other narrated the story. And the girl narrating the story was this girl, this bloke had asked, if he could explain the story. Um, and then there was this big storm blew up. And we weren't allowed to use this reel-to-reel -reel tape because it's very expensive. If it got wet, it damaged it, and we had to pack it all away if it started raining. So the storm, you could see lightning and thunder, and, and you could see the rain coming down. But our bit was dry. Once or twice, we we spotted a couple of spots of rain. We were just praying our socks off; it wouldn't it wouldn't rain. And we got the whole film done. Then we call people, present the gospel, call people forwards, and took the last, the last few names and addresses down on a bit of paper and people who wanted to follow up put a bit of paper in my back pocket all the equipment had been packed away and all that was left was a screen that was up there behind me and, and all of a sudden, you know before a storm the wind picks up the wind picked up, this thing blew down I managed to catch the top of it because it was on guy ropes and all of a sudden the rain just came down in buckets and within two minutes we had six inches of water under our feet and we had to walk up the hill to get to take all the equipment. And it was just like God was holding this, this massive rainstorm on just to the last minute. It was actually just as I wrote the last name. It's just amazing. It's just, we just saw miracles happening like that all the time. And that's what happens when you go out. Go out and when you're scared stiff and go out and share share your faith because God is going to be with you Amen. And, um, it's so exciting there's nothing more exciting in the world now I'd just like to share this is a, a sort of thing that I use a sort of daily preparation I use when I go out to share the gospel um, I mean you probably all know this but it's good to remember and be reminded um, it's just something to, to help make sure you're in the right place with God before you go out and it's just a few steps first step is obviously sin can get in our lives kind of we can all fall into sin at different times well we all do but we should confess it but sometimes something's really bothering you can't forgive someone or or you know you haven't really dealt with it properly so you've got to make sure you deal with the sin in your mind because if you don't you know the devil will come around you know be self-controlled and alert the devil the enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion lion looking to pull someone down. He's waiting for that foothold to grab hold of you. And if you're not um, confessing your sins regularly, you'll get pulled down, then you'll just be ineffective as, as you go out and share your faith. And also in Psalm 66, if I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. You know, you can't speak to God when you've got that barrier of sin in play. So, it's, you know, it's really important. I know you all know this stuff, but it's good to be reminded. And it's just, just make sure that it's all dealt with and being forgiven. But don't worry about afterwards. Once you're forgiven, you're forgiven. You don't be thinking, oh, how can God forgive that one? He always does. This is a God of full of grace. Um, the second point, make sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit. We all need to bring up the Holy Spirit, don't we? Mm. We all leak. We all need to make sure that we... Um, it's a promise of God, but understand this, the Lord's will is, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to constantly be filled up again. Having a worship session with Danny was just a, just a ticket, isn't it, to fill us up again before you go out. Um, and the third point is, it's the key to producing the fruit of the Spirit, which we talked about earlier. 
Um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When, when you're living, as I said this earlier, when you live like that, God sees the love of Jesus and the fruit of the Spirit shining out of us. The more we're like that, the more we can be used by God. Um, and, the, and the fourth point is to humbly understand your authority and position as a child of God. You know, we, we are Christ's ambassador. We looked at that earlier. He's ambassador. It's amazing, isn't it? We have all the authority. You know, in, in Matthew 28, what's the last words Jesus said in Matthew 28? Can you remember those? The Great Commission? Yeah. All authority has been given unto me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go and make disciples of all nations. I mean, he's given us that authority. Um, and our adequacy is from God. Um, that um, 2 Corinthians verse I've written down here somewhere. Um, Such confidence we have through Christ Jesus before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything from ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And um, God will give us triumph. If we go out and do all those things, but God, but thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. You know, the aroma of God just comes out and um, people sense it and catch it. And God has planned our time each day. Ephesians 2 says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared us in advance to do. God's prepared us in advance to go out and do this stuff. So, um, and the evidence which is to be found in Ephesians 5, 19 to 21, which says this, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, when we live like that, that's, that's the evidence of, of, of God working through us. And um, it's um, a great thing to, to sort of go out and share like that. But um, I just thought I'd finish before our time runs out, just to share a couple of stories of, as I mentioned earlier, my, my main ministry is going from door to door and house to house and just talking to people about Jesus. Um, and I, I just wanted to encourage you, as, I mean a lot of people aren't interested, as you know, you've got to find the one that is interested. So you've got to be prepared to have lots of no's, no interests, or slam doors occasionally, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but um, when you get to that person that um, God wants you to speak to, because there's always one that God wants you to speak to, and you go out and share it. Um, and one day I knocked on this door, and this girl came to the door, probably about 15, and I thought she was a bit too young for me to stand talking to for too long. Um, so I just said to her, um, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And she said, well, I don't believe in God. I said, oh, why is that then? She goes, because my mum, dad, my dad walked out on us when I was 11. Mm. Um, she looked really hurt. So I changed, I, I thought it was too, she was too hurt to talk about it. So I changed the subject. And I just shared my testimony. I shared how I became a Christian, how God changed my life, mm. how I experienced God's love. Mm. And I just said to her, I just believe God is a God of love. And then shared a few stories of how I'd seen God do a few miracles. And, um, and then I said to her, you know, this world is a hurting and broken world. There's so many people go around hurting each other and doing nasty things to one another. You know, sometimes a dad will walk out on a family and leave the hurts. But it's not God's fault. Yeah. And she turned around to me and said, well, I do believe in God. It wasn't that she didn't believe in God. It was because she was hurt by what her dad did and made her think it was God's fault. Which deep down she knew it wasn't. And then I was unable to share the gospel with her. Opened up, and you could see the Holy Spirit at work in her life. It was almost like the pain and the hurt of the past was gradually melting away. And I just explained how God could help her through that pain and 
She didn't become a Christian on the spot, but I left her a gospel tract. And I never saw her again. She was never in when I left back. But it's just amazing how God takes you to places and you can just help people move on a little bit and try and be a vessel where God can work through us to help. There's so many people are wrecked by emotional problems that are holding them back from Satan's got them in a captivity. We need to somehow be praying and linking in the Holy Spirit to guide us in our conversation so that we know what to say at the right time. And it's a skill that, you, that you'll just develop as you do. As you speak to people, you just be saying these arrow prayers up all the time. Yeah? Help me know what to say next. What verse should I use? What should I say? What experience should I share? You know, all these things. And, just, and the Holy Spirit works with us as, as we talk to people. Um, but the great thing about um, working on the doorsteps is that you can go back and speak to people. I spoke to a young lad who was, he was probably about 17. Uh, he wants to be a computer programmer. Um, he was looking for a job as an apprentice. He didn't want to go to the university because it cost a little. He didn't have any money to fund it. He didn't want to be in debt for the rest of his life. So um, he didn't believe in God. Uh, well, he was unsure if he believed in God, wasn't he? Never really heard much about Jesus, was never brought up with a Christian background, didn't understand anything about the Christian faith hardly at all. So I just, um, I always share my testimony because it's, it shows the power of God without putting too much pressure on people. And then I said, to, Could I pray for you? So I just prayed for him that he'd find a job <coughs> just like he wanted and we'd left him with that. I went back six months later and he was there, he answered the door and said, Oh, I'm off sick. Off work, you sick this week. Do you want to come in and have a cup of tea? <laughs> he said, I've got a job about a week after you prayed for me. Amen. So I shared my testimony again and I said, Do you understand the Lord of Jesus? Do you know who he is and what, what, why he was on this planet? No, I don't know anything about him really. But you've heard that he died and came back to life. Yeah, sort of, he said, but no idea why. So I shared the whole gospel message and he was asking questions. He didn't come to faith at that point, but again, God moved him forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just, it's just God at work. Um, and it's just so exciting to be used by God in those sort of ways. And I'll go back and see him in six months and hopefully he'll be off sick with some, uh, something else wrong. Right <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, you know, you get... As you go out, you, you will meet people. And sometimes I'll go out for two hours and nothing happens. And then the very last house, someone, someone becomes to faith on a doorstep, which is incredible. You know, um, yeah, it's just exciting. Yeah. yeah, so I just started praying. So Father Lord, I just thank you for everything we've heard so far. Thank you for Derek being here. Thank you for Danny leading the worship. It was truly, I felt your presence tangibly in this room, Lord God, as the worship was going on. And even as Derek was sharing, Lord God, you are here, Lord God. So I just pray in this last session, I, I believe you have spoken to me specifically about certain things, even though I have to tweak what the topic of the session is. But I will, yeah, so just let your voice with calm and really do what you want to do, Lord God. Just be with us, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen. And um, also, I would say, I know the guys who are going to do the food want everything to run smoothly, but just get the full session, and then whatever time it's going to take for you to set up when the session is finished, then people will patiently wait uh, since it's free lunch. That, but I know it's set up, but okay, praise the Lord, but don't go before the session, and that's what I mean, to start preparing, because I wanted to get the fullness of the course. But um, yeah, so this. The, as I said, mentioned in the prayer, we're going to briefly go into sharing your testimony, which is on page 13. But the Holy Spirit has also, in this week, instructed me to talk about a few other things. Um, and yeah, as we go along, I guess, even our curriculum, um, I know for next year, maybe even this session should be the first session. But maybe it's good that it's the last session of today, because you'll see how it, what God is going to do. But um, you will understand. Sometimes I talk and you think, what is he talking about? But it makes sense after. <laughs> but, um, and feel, your, feel free to raise your hands. and Yeah, you will know, get to know me for those who don't. I'm, I'm, I can be a funny character in a sense. I'm 
can be weird at times, but we are peculiar people, and uh, Amen. as Derek told us, that's the kind of people God wants to use, you know. And I'm happy about, I'm comfortable in my peculiarity, you know. I'm comfortable as a strange man. Um, <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, so, um, telling your story or telling your testimony um, on page 13. Uh, we're gonna kind of skim through it and not go in depth, but yeah, we still. So yeah, and I like how it starts um, because we are at the ghost school. Oh yeah, briefly, uh, the reason why we've put the upper room. You know, there was. Um, I just sh I've shared it on the phone with a few of you, but let everyone that's here today. Prior to the ghost school, so about ten days ago or nearly two weeks, I met an auntie, auntie Nigerian auntie, on Seabird Road, which is this road. And uh, I get, I, we know each other for years, and she knows I'm an evangelist, and I, I know she's a prayerful woman. And then I said, Auntie, I'm going to give you a flyer, and it was the flyer about the ghost school, and um, I want you to pray about it. And I believe that she wouldn't even fully get it. When I say that, I'm not talking about intelligence. No, just that, I don't know, I just thought in my mind, she won't even fully get what it's about. But, um, so I, but I did tell her it's an evangelist school. And, but... She got it straight away in the sense that she started prophesying about it. As she picked up the flyer, and she encouraged all of you as well. She said, oh, this thing is going to be like the upper room. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you each time that you come together. And God is going to handpick each student that is going to come. So if you are here, it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident. God has handpicked you to be at the launch and the first year of the Gold School, which is going to go into many other years. And, and I really sense, again, that it will go internationally. And, and who knows? You might be some of the teachers sent out or here. You might come on other years and teach, you know. Who knows? And God's going to do great visions through you guys as well. And I, honestly, yeah. So that was just... So welcome to the upper room. And we walked up the stairs. And we are in the upper room, literally. And up, lastly, about the atmosphere of this room. Which is right to talk about atmosphere. Our pastor, which... I'm not going to go into the whole story, but we didn't have the back of this building for a long time and God has graciously given us the full uh, building. So we never had this room, we only recently started using it like God is really even choosing us to... We, are kind of, we had a few prayer meetings so far as a church, but nothing really from the outside. So you guys are kind of inaugurating this room and our, what our pastor had already seen in dreams and vision is that people here will be laying on, on the floor, repenting. You know, like powerful spiritual things happening in this very same room. You know? So, um, praise the Lord. That's just, um, welcome to the upper room, the ghost school upper room. Praise the Lord. And, and I say this, yeah, alright, that's fine. Um, so, and yeah, you see, just from the word go, I explained all of that. He says, go home. Um, and we are learning not to go in every sense of the way. So now this is Jesus telling a man, let me give you the background story of this man in Mark 5. It's, uh, you know, most of you, uh, if not all, know the story of the man who was demon possessed and he, he was so frightening. People wouldn't even approach him. Do you know why? He had actually broken shackles. Physically, he was so strong that he had broken shackles and he was free and loose and completely off his mind. And um, this is the kind of guy that also God is after. God is not after. When we go out tonight, this afternoon, we are not only looking at the people that look proper and look like us. We're looking at the homeless. We're looking at those who look deranged. Because sometimes it's easy. We'll be with tracks and it's easy to really pick the people we're going to talk to. That's not what God wants. God wants to talk to everyone. So it's not how people look that. So um, this guy was, was in that condition. And then... Even for time's sake, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but some of you are familiar with it. But he gets set free by, by Jesus. Even the demons have recognized who Jesus is. And he gets set free. The demons are expelled, which I also believe in the ghost school. We're going to learn and witness in the streets people being free of, of spirits and, and healed right in front of our eyes. And right in front of you praying for certain of these people as well. And, um, and then they go into... Uh, a herd of pigs, 2,000 pigs, and those pigs go into the sea and they drown. And, but the, the point is, 
that straight after, what would we do first of all if we see that kind of, and all of this is, it's not even in notes. Me, I really rely on a lot of the Holy Spirit when, when I teach, but, and, and Derek, as well, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying he doesn't, but I'm just saying that he's, I'm just now flowing, flowing. I didn't even prepare to say all of that. But what kind of people do we, uh, what would happen if someone like that would come into our church? I mean, some of us will probably move seats. <laughs> some of us will tell the usher, why did you let him in? And you know, things like that. Well, hopefully not in our own church, but uh, it, can, but it happened in church. Let me be real, these things happen. And, um, but would we ordain a guy, not in his right mind, and he come to a service, and he get in his right mind, and ordain him as, as an evangelist straight away? Would we do that? No. No way, I even wouldn't do that. What does Jesus do? That's what he does. I mean, there's no ceremony of ordination, but really and truly, because the guy asked Jesus as he's going with his disciple on the boat, he says, can I please come with you? You know, he's met this Jesus, full of love in his eyes and his heart, who set him free. He's never experienced that for so many years. Now, obviously, he longs to be with Jesus, so we also need to long to be with Jesus. But Jesus tells him, no, stay in Decapolis, go home to your family, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. So do you understand what I'm saying? He's telling him to go and do the work of an evangelist. So that the man went away and began to tell Nicopolis how much Jesus had done for him. And I don't know why there's an important part that's missing me in the training manual, but it's fine. And they all marveled. Because he doesn't need to talk much. They knew who he was. They recognized him physically. And now he's like as natural as Derek. As sane as me, you know, he's proper, he's walking, he has bright clothes, he's shaking hands. So, this guy, do you think there's people in Decapolis who, be, who gave their life to Christ after Christ left? I believe there was a great amount of people. But do you understand also the point that Jesus straight away entrusted him with that message? But he didn't even, in this case, in the scenario that we hear, he didn't even teach him how to preach the gospel, or he didn't even send him to preach the gospel. Why did he send him? Go and tell your story. And in this case, he didn't even need to say much of his story. But our story is very important, because uh, I, 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 I will stick to this now. So why use story? Well, he avoids arguments, because one thing, if you start saying the Bible says, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, because you should say the Bible says outside, but you should feel led what God tells you. But when you start telling, for me, Samuel, I used to go clubbing, I used to sleep around with women and all of that, that was my life. And then I stopped, I gave my life fully to Christ and I, I stopped um, going clubbing, told my friend, they thought it wouldn't last. And then um, I started serving God and I wasn't having no more sexual relations with women and all of that. And, and God had delivered me and then yeah, then it led to me to roof and all of that. But no one can argue with me that that did that didn't happen to me. Do you understand? They can't argue it. They can argue biblical points if they want. We know it's the truth. But they cannot argue with you that this happened to you. Right. Unless they say you're a liar. That's mm -hmm. another but so he avoids argument and people will really attack another person's personal experience because they will see in your eyes you're genuine and they so also a second point why I use your story, it's easy to remember. You don't need to quote Second Chronicles, um, Ezra, and all of that. It's your own story. You know it. You've experienced it. You can't forget it. You know. So and so, some people find it hard to remember gospel outlines. With a bit of practice, most of us will be able to tell our stories in an accurate and engaging way. So some ingredients. Um, Jesus should be at the center of our stories. It's so easy to focus on ourselves and forget that we are meant to do. To be doing is explaining how we came to follow him. So yeah, G Jesus really needs to be at the center of everything we share. You know, even when we share about us, we could also fall in the, the temptation of uh, want to make it sound how we made it, how we've done it, what we've achieved. And really and truly, I mean, me honestly, I could have not achieved nothing, nothing. Uh, I can't even explain how. I know everything that happens in my life is God. God, God, and God. Amen. So that we should always remember, remember that. And it's also easy to turn to our stories into tales of how much our personal and psychological needs were met as if Jesus is a social worker. 
But it is important to mention the need for forgiveness of sin. That's very important in our message because without understanding sin, yet there is no need of a savior. There is no need of even Jesus dying on the cross. There is no need of a perfect sacrifice. And most people out there will tell you they believe they are a good person. And if you ask them, do you think you're going to heaven? Oh yeah, yeah. They don't in relation with Christ, but they think they're going to heaven because they have not killed someone, they have not raped someone. But that is a lie. Yeah. yeah. And yesterday in a seminar somewhere I was reminded there's only the truth, which is Jesus Christ yeah. and the Word of God. And anything outside of that, any other religion, any theory, any explanation, it's a lie. So when people think that because being good will bring them to heaven, it's a, it's a lie. So you, you, we must, in our testimony, incorporate... So you must be open. Like I just told you, my sin was women and all of that. And even when I met Ruth, for example, I told her straight away, I didn't start hiding it or stuff like that. It's part of my life. I'm not proud of it, but that's, that was my journey. So, and thirdly, in this little part, is the emphasis should be on the impact of God's grace in our life. Since we come to know Jesus, we mustn't make the mistake of spending too much time talking about our lives before we became Christian. Sometimes people with inexperience, or they will spend also so long, like if it was me, I could start describing the clubs and I start describing how the women look and all of that. Do you understand? Like spending so much emphasis on the and there and I enjoyed it and I and I used to drink and and you know and it goes on in ten minutes and it was so fantastic and, 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 and you don't know the person might tell you oh I really need to go yeah. and all they will have here is you glorifying yeah. sin and, and that dark line so you need to cut the line at the right time yeah. and actually it's a brief outline of your sinful past and more now describe because don't forget that your testimony is not only you giving your life to Christ. Your testimony is what happens as you walk, walk in and journey with Jesus. Amen. And none of us are perfect, no. but we are being transformed and we're becoming more like Jesus each day. But good things happen. I can tell you briefly again. Before I was in Christ, uh, you know, I, just, I shared it. But then I came to Christ, started serving God, stopped the grave, stopped the girls, and serving God. And then got married to a beautiful, fantastic woman of God. Got beautiful children. Uh, as I got married, then when I met Ruth, I, I honestly could bear, no, I couldn't. I couldn't really use a computer. I couldn't even really type on a computer. I could, maybe with one finger like that, and really <laughs> taking a long time. But I couldn't, there was no fluency. And then Ruth said, oh, why don't you come and do a small IT course? And you know, she used to work in a school and started that. Then went Bible college, from Bible college, went university, yeah, yeah. university, graduated yeah. in theology. Yeah. And, and yeah. now, even the last, but this is all testimonies of what happened in Christ. Yeah. If I had it, Jesus did it all for me. Yeah. And I was just obedient and a vessel. And now the last little bit, and there's many others. But now God has moved us from a small flat in Deptford to live in a two-bedroom house that we couldn't even afford ourselves right now. But we are in there right now. Amen. And God made powerful arrangement that we live in a two-bedroom house in East Ham, which is a right away from, from the church. But this is all you get. This is all things that God has done that is valuable. So if I spend too much time talking about the clubs, then people will switch and disconnect. So let's go. Because today our, our assignment in this afternoon is to go and meet people and try. We're not going to force it upon people, but try to share our testimony with us. Or if you see the conversation is more suited for just sharing the gospel, please do. But we will want to put in practice sharing our stories. Um, so... So, um, it, what makes a good story, um, you know what, I feel I'm going to leave that, you can read it. What we can, I don't know, Lord, um, guys, and, and God as well. I think, normally, and it's good, and maybe you, I'll put it to you, but no, 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 let me, it's just time, guys, I'm just, no, but no, let me not rush too much. This is a proper training, if we go a little bit over, it's just I really want to stick to time as much as we can. <coughs> Sorry, I'm journeying alongside with you guys. So I'm going to take time to do this. Please uh, pair up with someone and uh, use, I was going to skip it, but no, it's important. Pair up with someone and uh, share your testimony to each other in two minutes. I know it's hard, but in two minutes each. And then, um, and then we'll come back. Um, is that? Yeah. yeah.
Let's just do that. And then we see if you know each other, go to someone you don't know, please. Let's break up familiarities today. And even the our people, please find someone you don't know. And Debbie, not with your neighbor. Imagine little clips. Every time I watch it, I get goose bumps. Every single time. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to show you. Can I share a little test with the pastor? Look at his watch. He said, you've got three minutes. And this man proceeded. He said, I just moved into this area. I used to live in another part of London. I came from Sydney, Australia. And just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives. And I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney? It runs from the business hub out to the rocks, the colonial area. And he said, a strange little white-haired man stepped out of the shop doorway, put a pamphlet in my hand, and he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astounded by those words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously, and all the way on British Airlines, back to Heathrow, this puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in this new area, where I'm living now, and thank God he was a Christian, he led me to Christ, and I'm a Christian, and I want to fellowship here. And back to no testimonies like it. Everyone applauded and welcomed him into the fellowship. That Baptist pastor flew to Adelaide in Australia the next week. And ten days later, in the middle of a three-day series in a Baptist church in Adelaide, a woman came to him for counseling. He wants to establish where she stood with Christ. And she said, I used to live in Sydney. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends in Sydney, doing some last minute shopping down George Street, and a strange little white-haired man, elderly man, stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pat and said, excuse me, ma'am, you say if you die tonight, you're going to heaven. She said, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church was on the next block from me, and I sought out the pastor, and he led me to Christ. So, so I'm telling you that I am a Christian. Now, this London pastor was not very puzzled. Twice, within a fortnight, he heard the same testimony. He then flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for a meal. And he said, mate, how to get saved? He said, I grew up in this church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. Never made a commitment to Jesus, just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. And because of my business ability, grew up to a place of influence. I was on a business outing in Sydney just three years ago, and an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped out of a stop shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet, cheap junk, and accosted me with a question. Excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, I was seeing with anger all the way home on Francis to, to Perth. He said, I told my pastor, thinking he would sympathize with me, and my pastor agreed. He had been disturbed for years, knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and he was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. He then flew the following week to a similar Keswick convention in the Caribbean, to missionaries. And he shared the testimonies. At the close of his teaching session, three missionaries came up and said, we got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through that little man's testimony and asking us that same question on George Street in Sydney. Coming back to London, he stopped outside Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at a naval chaplain's convention. And when his three days of revving these naval chaplains up, over a thousand of them, in Solvany, the chaplain general took him out for a meal. And he said, how did you become a Christian? He said, well, it was miraculous. I was a rating on a United States battleship, and I lived a reprobate life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific, and we docked in Sydney Harbour for replenishments. We hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I got on the wrong bus, got off in George Street, and... <laughs> I got off the bus. I thought it was a ghost. This elderly white-haired man jumped in front of me, pushed a pamphlet into my hand and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, the fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober and ran back to the battleship, sought out the chaplain. The chaplain led me to Christ. And I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am in charge of over a thousand chaplains who were bent on soul with me today. That London preacher... Six months later, flew to do a convention for 5,000 Indian missionaries in a remote corner of northeastern India. And at the end 
The Indian missionary in charge, a humble little man took him home to his humble little home for a simple meal. And he said, how did you, as a Hindu, come to Christ? He said, I was in a very privileged position. I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission. And I traveled the world. And I am so glad for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin, because I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I got into. He said, one thousand of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. <laughs> and I was doing some last minute shopping, laden with parcels of toys and clothing for my children, walking down George Street. And this courteous little white-haired man stepped out in front of me, offered me a pamphlet, and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. He said, I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to my town, I sought out the Hindu priest, and he couldn't help me. But he gave me some advice. He said, just to satisfy your curious mind, nothing else, go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road, and that was faithful advice. He said, because that day the missionary led me to Christ, I quit Hinduism immediately, and then began to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service, and here I am, by God's grace, in charge of all these missionaries, and we are winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Well, eight months later, that Crystal Palace Baptist pastor was ministering in Sydney, in Gaimia, southern suburb of Sydney, and he said to the Baptist minister, do you know a little man, an elderly little man, who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street? And he said, I do. His name is Mr. Genor, G-E-N-O-R. But I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. And that's said, I want to meet him. Two months later, they went around this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He sat them down, made them some tea, and he was so afraid he was slopping tea into the sauce as he shook. And as he sat with them, this London preacher told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man sat with tears running down his cheeks. He said, my story goes like this. He said, I was a rating on an Australian warship, and I lived a reprobate life, and in a crisis, I really hit the wall, and one of my colleagues whom I gave literal hell was there to help me. He led me to Jesus, and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours, and I was so grateful to God. I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people a day, as God gave me strength. Sometimes I was ill, I couldn't do it, but I made up for it for other times. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I have done this for over 40 years, and in my retirement years, the best place was on George Street. There were hundreds of people. I got lots of rejections. But a lot of people courteously took the tracks. And he said, in 14 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until today. You know, I would say, that has to be commitment. That has to be just sheer gratitude and love for Jesus to do that, not hearing of any results. Margarita did a little count. That's 146,100 people. That simple little non-charismatic Baptist man influence somehow to Jesus. And I believe what God was showing that Baptist minister was the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of this iceberg. Goodness knows how many more had been arrested for Christ and were doing huge jobs out in the mission field. Mr. Gennel died two weeks later. And can you imagine the reward he went home to in heaven? I doubt if he spelled welcome and the red carpet and the fanfare he went home to when he arrived in glory. Amen. Well, yeah, I'm just going to share with you um, about the, the Holy Spirit, um, which that is not in the booklet, but uh, it's, it's very simple, very basic, all scriptures that you know, but we just use that as a point of reference to allow God to do what he wants to do. We're using his word. Two. So the first scripture I want to read is Acts 2, 1, 5. Um, you can turn to it on your phone or on your Bible. <coughs> Act two. Acts chapter 2. Praise the Lord. This is that day, the day of Pentecost, which was a very, and still is, big, massive Jews <coughs> festival where people will come from all different parts of the world into Jerusalem to, to celebrate. So... When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And the tongues, like flames of fire that were divided, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages 
as the spirit gave them the ability for speech. So these guys were all together and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they had like tongues of fire on top of their heads, you know. And the fire of God came upon them and at that point they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that now God is putting a fire inside of our hearts. A fire is coming upon us. And I also believe that the Holy Spirit is very key. And I know, but I can gather that most of us are from similar church background. But if there was someone from a different similar church background, what I'm going to share with you now, doctrinally, they are debates and disagreement even and just differences of belief so I'm, I can't say that this is what I believe in uh, but I can't say that it's the the only way form of expression of worship or I know but I do believe that when you are truly and there's different levels of being filled with the Holy Spirit I'm not saying you can't be in a relationship with the Holy Spirit but I do believe that when you are filled with the Holy Spirit there is an outward manifestation that takes place and a sign which is the expression of talking in tongues and you can read it through the book of Acts I don't read anywhere where the Bible says and they just got filled there's always something that happens there's other things that happen there's also other accounts where they say they prophesy them but there's something that happens uh, to me it would be really impossible for the Holy Spirit to come and reside right inside of you and there will be no nothing it will just be like that oh, I, feel, I can feel the Holy Spirit no move, nothing. And all these, some were more dramatic than others in how it happened to us. And uh, I used to shake a lot, like un uncontrollably, uh, when, when I first received the Holy Spirit. It was really, like, very. Um, and I'm not saying that if someone doesn't shake like that, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm saying. But if you say that, well, you, you will feel that nothing happened at that time. And also, there's nothing changing to your life. I will question that. But anyway, so. The expression of speaking in tongues to me is like a sign that yes, you, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and the, this speaking in tongues is a, it's a heavenly language. Is your spirit talking directly to God in a language that you can't even understand yourself unless you have the gift of interpretation, which I would say is quite rare. But some, some, some have it, but I don't think it's a common gift. But Paul tells us to... Um, covet all gifts so I will also encourage you on this journey on the gold school covet and ask God for all gifts I'm asking for all gifts I do not flow in all the gifts I don't flow in all the gifts uh, but I would like to um, so that that's that with the Holy Spirit I mean that's not that I'm still coming but also one very important point if you just turn to the chapter before in Acts 1 and verse 8 Jesus speaking uh, himself. So Acts 1 verse 8. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think I spoke about tongues briefly. Well, just as an outward sign. I'm not going to teach you for an hour about speaking in tongues and that. And I'm going to say why I'm saying that. And I think sometimes it's forgotten in church and not taught enough, yeah? But the main reason for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit is in this verse. The main reason, maybe not the only reason, but the main reason is, is here, it says here, is to be witnesses. So God places His Spirit inside of us so that we become His witnesses. When there is a, a, a law court, a court case in the law, and there's a judge, there's um, some lawyers, and there's victims and accusers and all of that. And then there are witnesses. They come and they give an account of truly what they've experienced. If they were, they, they were there and they saw it. And that's what God wants us to, to do. To be witnesses of His goodness, to be witnesses of His gospel, to be witnesses of His word. And that is the main reason, I would say, for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. So sometimes we think, oh, the Holy Spirit is, is for other things and, I don't know, uh, blessings and getting houses and getting money and all of that. And yeah, it's part of, of, of it as well, but it's, that's so secondary. Seek the kingdom of God first and all His righteousness 
and, and all these things will be added. What are these things? House, wives, husbands, whatever you're looking for. They will be added. And I'm a living testimony. It's been added. When I stopped, <coughs> repented, confessed Jesus Christ, believed in my heart that He is um, that God raised Him from the dead, then He had added all these things. At, at the moment, honestly, guys, it's like I'm living in a dream. When I look at my wife, when I look at my children, when I look at the home we're living in, and I will tell you another time, not in maybe in teaching context, but how even we got this home and we, that we hardly, we're not paying anything for the home, but that will be even hard for you to understand. But um, um, that's God. Um, so yeah, the Holy Spirit. So and the, the the last scripture that will be more for one who's speaking in their seat. Uh, but I don't know if the Holy Spirit is for me or or if they've never received the Holy Spirit. So I, I read the the last scripture. It's in Luke chapter eleven. Luke chapter eleven, verse thirteen. So Luke 11 verse 13 and that's if you want to now on the street and to people if you want to start talking about the Holy Spirit to people and they have questions and yes yeah, some will say well in some churches they will say oh that was back then uh, the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and no 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 that's for all disciples that's for all believers all the promises in the Bible are for all of us there's not some that were for before and after and, and not now. and No, no, no. God still is the same yesterday, today and forever. Amen. So all these things. So if you're talking, this is a good verse to share with people. And if people say, oh, I don't think God wants to give it to me. I just think it's not for me and all of that. Yeah. Luke eleven thirteen says, if you then who are evil, how know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, an earthly father, when they say evil, yes, yeah, some, some earthly father are evil, some earthly father are not evil, but still, because of the fallen nature, we have certain wrong things in us. So even me, as a, well, obviously it's different because I've been saved and we are all saved and born again. So God is changing me. But there's still parts of me that are not perfect. And even towards my children, there is still parts of my heart. I mean, I don't see it myself, but I would say as a human, um, that will not be perfect. But I'm still able to give her good things. Whatever I can buy for Elysia on Christmas, I bought her a violin, and she plays the violin now and things like that. And, you know, and I, I try to, you know, um, if me, as, as in my, how I am, so how much more God wants to give us good gifts? Mm. And one of his good gifts is um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's all tied in with the Holy Spirit. Because that's why I wanted to... That's why actually God directed me to speak about this. And I'm going to call people in a second to respond to prayer. If you want to be prayed for. And I'm going to invite Danny back. Uh, which he can also kind of start getting ready with your guitar. He can come. And we're going to just go into a small time of worship. And, but what I'm saying is that... I'll give you an example. Um, I probably won't name the organization. There's a there's a big old mission organization, and the man has come to speak in the past in our church, mm -hmm. and they they are massive organization. And even Pastor Peter, which is the senior pastor of the Our Church, this church, um, has been uh, going to speak on um, in, in conferences, and I have had the privilege to go with him. But my and I make a whole point here. And then, but they're not really keen on the Holy Spirit. They don't speak much about it. I don't even know if they're against it. I mean, again, not against, but if they believe it was back then. I, but they're not big on the Holy Spirit. And my, I remember Pastor Peter was saying one day, um, oh, all the mission works that they are doing, if they had the Holy Spirit with them, mm. how much more would they accomplish? And he gave an image, which I want to share with you today. He said, it's a bit like, you have to imagine your job will be to sow down trees, but whole. You have to. How would you say that? Sow down the whole forest. Is that how you? Yeah, I think so. You would have to sow down the whole forest, but you go in with your little pocket knife and you start the job of sowing <laughs> down this forest by yourself. Yeah, as if you could have the Holy Spirit and He will give you the tools and whatever it will be a big 
uh, thing that will sow hundreds of trees one by one. Do you, do you understand the image I'm saying? Eh? Mm. But doing evangelism without the Holy Spirit is setting yourself to fail. You know. Mm. So that's why I wanted to speak. And then Derek has mentioned, and we hadn't mentioned all of that. So that's all. Even the fact that he, he he spoke about this man, and I want to show you and all of that. It's all the Holy Spirit tying it all together. And Derek has mentioned on many occasions in his session about the dependency on the Holy Spirit. And um. So yeah, basically, we need the Holy Spirit, and He's gonna help us do this job of evangelism much better. Because once the Holy Spirit comes and resides in your heart, if it's not the case yet, then also spiritual gifts can be added onto that. Because there are fruits and gifts of the Spirit. But if you do not have the Spirit, mm -hmm. then you cannot enjoy these gifts and you cannot enjoy these fruits. And once you have these gifts, they can be words of knowledge, they can be healings. Uh, working of miracles and there's there's nine um, gifts of the spirit that are listed in the Bible. For some reason, I believe there is more in in the kingdom and even in our life. But that's all that's listed. Um, yeah. So, with that being said, so Danny, please, could you come, please? Um, and if the other mic works, we um, did the other mic stop working? Yeah, okay, it's fine. But um, but yeah, Ruth, at some point you can come and, and take the mic. When I start praying, I don't need to. Yeah, you can come actually, please, Ruth. So we're going to enter a moment of worship again. And uh, I'm going to invite you guys to come to the front to for different things. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and with the few things I've shared today, you want to experience that today, then come to the front and we'll pray for that. If you're already baptized and obviously you want more, Come for that again. And whatever else, healing, restoration, this altar will, is open for anything. God can do it. It's, there's going to be something that's going to happen in the room very soon. As soon as they start worshiping, it's already, oh, obviously, I know that the Holy Spirit is already here and all of that. But, and I will also, rem and okay, I was informed by a member of here that they kept on hearing that the harvest, wait, baby, you have to wait, wait, wait. that the harvest. Is, is ripe and ready. Yeah? The harvest for evangelism. So don't go out thinking it's going to be hard. Don't, don't go out even thinking that people don't want to hear you. I'm not going to say that when we go, everyone's going to. But go out with the mind. I go out with the mindset that people are, want to listen to what I have to say. And some will. And some are very hungry. We are in actually in a very spiritual age, guys. <coughs> Although it's are not directed towards new ageism and, and all sorts of. But people want to know spiritual things and witchy boards and witchcrafts and even children and Harry Potter. That is a search of the Almighty God that is being directed by the enemy in so many other things. And what was I saying that just now? I don't know. Well, Praise the Lord. The desire for evangelism. Therefore, therefore, yeah. Oh yeah, it's saying that don't go and think that our yeah. oh, people are not ready, they don't want to listen. People do want to listen outside. I, I, I have discussions all the time. Derek has discussions all the time. Danny and some of you, I, I'm not, but some of you have discussions all the time. People want to hear it. But I, I'm saying the harvest is ready. I won't share that. I, I'll share that because I have time to share in each session. But I will share something about that readiness of the harvest. How I used to see it and how God changed it in my mind and how I see it differently and it helps. So as I said, you can be on your feet to worship God. And, um